name is Zachary Woods. I am the SGA president this year, which is the Student Government Association. Um, and Jake right here is going to speak a little bit more about what SGA is about and like how it's kind of set up for this year. All right. Well, hello, freshmen. How is everyone today? My name is Jake Powell, and I am the SGA vice president, the student body vice president on campus this year. So SGA is comprised of four senators from each class and then 16 senators that represent colleges and, and, repre and represent departments um, across campus. So a total of 32 individuals representing the student body and representing our needs and wants. So SGA will be your prime uh, place for voicing your concerns and your wants and needs. Um, we have an email address. It's sgaatlander.edu. You can contact the executive team um, at that email address. And now I'll hand it over to Alyssa. Hey you guys, my name is Alyssa Whittle. I'm the student government secretary. If you guys are interested at all in student government, be looking out for an email within the next week from us. Freshman, sorry, freshman elections are going to be um, this coming week, so if you, the best way to be involved in SGA is to run for office. So you'll see an email about running for office through SGA. Like I said, we have four senators from each class, so it will be four senators from the freshman class. So if you're interested in running, please, please do so. Awesome. So I just want to get a couple words of advice for you guys. Um, coming into your freshman year, you really need to start making the best decisions for you and your life right now. You really need to be who you want to be or strive to be who you're wanting to be better, okay? And you need to also strive to really try to love everyone, okay? Because it's very, very important. You're gonna be seeing these same people around Lander most of the time. And once you realize that we're all part of the same Lander family, that's when your guys' journey really begins. And one part, one way you can actually start being a part of that Lander family is to start being involved on campus. I know I'm personally involved with an environmental organization, uh, Jake is involved with the Political Science Association, and Alyssa is involved with Greek Life, and we're all involved with much more than that. But once, like, there's over 70 plus clubs and associations here at Lander, and every single one of them are a part of that Lander family that I was talking about. So coming into your freshman year, I really want to challenge every single one of you to really push out of your comfort zone and be involved with something. Find a passion and love it. Really strive to be the best person you can really be. And on behalf of SGA, we want to wish you guys a first fantastic week at university and best of luck. Uh, and yeah, awesome. Thank you guys. And now Dr. Pilgrim of Link is going to be talking to you as well. I like to get the applause before I speak, so it looks like it's some applause. You guys, you get, I just want to say that you guys did a great job on the fire drill. If you were here earlier, you did a great job. So that was not in the plan. That will not be on the test. <laughs> All right, so I really appreciate you guys being calm and cool and collected on that. And it was a false alarm, so... Um, we're, we're good to go on that. So really, really appreciate all that. And thanks, uh, Zach and Anissa and um, Jake, Elisa, Alyssa, sorry, Alyssa and Jake. And I really appreciate them coming up here. And I asked them to welcome you first because um, I know you guys will listen to other students. You really will. And we're going to have peer leaders in your class, too, a lot of your classes. And so uh, always think about those peer leaders as someone you can uh, talk to and, and definitely your instructor in your link section as well. So um do take you know heart to what he said. Uh, I am Mark Pilgrim. Uh, I teach in the biology department. I'll be teaching biology link 101. Uh, you may be in my class. Um, I am uh, was the director. I need to correct myself, right? So I was the director, uh, and I'm still uh, fulfilling some of those roles today. But you'll meet the new director a little later. Um, but I'm I'm happy to see all you guys here. So it uh, it's great to see you. I have some notes. I'm going to introduce the speaker. So I actually looked at something she has, which is called a CV. Have you heard of a CV before? Kind of like a resume. You've heard a resume, right? Yeah. Okay. So 
it's my job as, as to introduce the speaker to tell you a little bit about her, right? So the first thing I'm going to do, I did my research. So the first thing I did is I looked at her CV. And so these are some ways that she thinks about herself. So we'll, she didn't know I was going to do this. So here are some words, and I agree with all of these. I've, I've met her, and, and, and uh, I agree with all of them. She says about herself, she's describing herself, thoughtful. She's collaborative. She's a servant leader. She's a lifelong learner. She's an active scholar. She's an active seeker of constructive feedback. She's always looking for personal improvement. She wants to advance and develop others' potential. And she has a sense of gratitude. Now, those are all traits I think we can all sort of aspire to. So I hope she inspires you. She said something earlier this morning um, to the faculty, other professors. We were in this same arena, and she was up here giving a different talk. And she was talking about her uh, college experience, and she talked about wanting to be an astronaut. She said that she was not interested. Uh, here's her quote. I wrote it down. She says, I didn't care anything about lift and drag. She ended up going in, uh, for, uh, into psychology. I want to say that her talk this morning was both lifting and did not drag us down. So I think she's, I think she's not only interested in those things, but she's, she's done a good job with them. So students describe her, you know, how you, some students, they just don't remember their professor's names, right? Y'all have like six or seven and we have like two or 300 students. That's, that's okay. You don't remember us. That's all right. Uh, so students describe her as the energetic one. So let's see if she lives up to that. Dr. Christina Downey, if you would come on down. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Pilgrim. I don't know if you're a hugger. I am. Yes. That was lovely. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Okay. Gotcha. Very good. Um, great. I got my timer on and everything. I have a picture that will be coming up soon, but in the meantime, there we go. Hi, my name is Dr. Christina Downey. I serve at Indiana University Kokomo, so I don't know if you know anything about Indiana, uh, Midwestern state, um, sometimes known for basketball, never known for football. Um, about an hour north of our capital, Indianapolis, is Kokomo, Indiana. Uh, and that's where I serve as Associate Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs and Student Success, and I'm a professor of psychology, and I have received the most warm welcome and invitation here to come and speak to you. The talk that I'm gonna share with you today um, is one that I give on our own campus to students who are new to college, and a lot of it is driven by uh, a lot of the background that I have um, in training as a clinical psychologist combined with um, the experience that I've had teaching for now 13 years um, on our own campus, which is very similar in terms of size, uh, in terms of student makeup, background, all that kind of thing. Actually, our campus is a lot like yours. Um, and so I am delighted um, to be able to share this talk with you. It's called the Dow of College. And that is pronounced Dow, not Tau, even though I will use the D um, as part of the conversation. So let's get into this. The Tao is an ancient Chinese concept, right? There is a spiritual tradition known as Taoism, right? Which focuses on this idea of a kind of life force and how we move through life in accord with the life force. So Tao literally translates into the way, the way. Um, there is a symbol You've seen this before. Yeah. What is that? Yin yang. Yin yang, right? Um, what does it mean? What does that symbol? Balance, balance. Okay, that's most often. That is the common association that Americans have with this particular symbol is the idea of balance. It's more than that. Actually, in 
ancient China, this is the symbol for the Tao. Okay? The Tao. This means the Tao. And it has to do with making one's way through life, right? In a way that is balanced, but also peaceful, and takes into account that there are aspects of life that are in accord with what we want, and there are aspects of life which are not, right? You can see that that is represented by the, not only the, the fact that there's kind of a swirling motion to the symbol, right? It, it, when you look at it, it looks like motion, it's movement, right? That is part of making one's way, it's an active thing. But also, the fields within, right? So the white dot within the black field, the black dot within the white field, right? That symbolizes how, whether things are going in one direction or another, there are always elements of that opposite in it, right? So I like to think of that as a nice kind of, I don't know, metaphor for starting college, because I imagine that I saw, I know, looking at you guys uh, walking around campus yesterday on move-in day, for those of you who are here, there was a lot of excitement, right? But that's also tied up with some anxiety, right? There's, oh my gosh, we're gonna be able to take care of ourselves now, we're gonna be independent. And there's also that element of, oh my gosh, I'm gonna have to be independent and be responsible for my choices, right? Like, this is just the reality of life, right? This is how we go. I'd like to take this model and really spell it out for you, some specific aspects of the way we make our way that we can really guide, and that now that you have 18 or 19 year old brains, most of you, right, you are actually physically equipped to start to do this. Um, when you were 14, my kid's 14, he's six foot two and hopeless, it's just how he is, right? I work with that reality. Um, he has no idea what he will be like when he's 18. He has no way to even really perceive that. And when you were 14, you didn't wake up on your 14th birthday and go, I know exactly what I want to be like at 18, and here's how I'm going to make myself that way. That, you've changed, right? If I were to ask you to write an essay about the ways you've changed since you were 14 years old, you could write books about that. You've changed in every way possible, right? But you experienced it as just happening to you. And that's very natural. That's totally how development goes during that particular phase of life, right? But from about now, from about now, a shift happens in the brain where you really start to be able to take conscious steps to take control, to foresee the future in a way, right? To play out. If I do this, it's likely to lead to that. If I do this, it's likely to lead somewhere else. And so you start to be able to build yourself, right? So there is a Tao of college in terms of thinking about how to build yourself into the person you really want to be. The T in the Tao, I think of as thought, right? There are some specific thoughts that we can have, beliefs, ideas, understandings that we can have about ourselves and the world that will change what happens to us and it will change what we do in this world, right? So we'll explore some of that. They told me to wait for transition. There we go. The A is action. I want you to walk away today from this talk being convinced that your goals are less important than your habits. Your goals are less important than your habits. People ask you all the time, particularly when you start college or when you're close to getting there, what would you like to do, right? What are you going to make of yourself? What are your goals? How are you going to get there? You spend a lot of time thinking about the end point, right? But that's less important than the day-to-day -day things you do because the day-to-day -day things you do are what get you closer to the end point you think you want or what take you further away. Those are called habits. Habits happen automatically. They're developed over time. They happen without thought, actually. And so what you need to do to start is figure out what are the habits I want. You practice them consciously for a while, and then they become just what you do. They become you, right? And so you could use some clues about how to approach that. We're going to talk through that. Hmm. Opportunity. The O is opportunity. Opportunities are around us all the time. Opportunities are bound by our environment. 
Our opportunities are bound by our environment. How many of you can swim? Put your hand in the air. You can swim. Okay. Prove it. Prove it. Prove it right now. Prove that you can swim. Okay. You can't. You can't convince me that you can swim because you are in an environment where you have no opportunity to swim. You are clothed wrong, you are seated, there's no water around. You have no opportunity to demonstrate to me what it is that you're able to do. Opportunity is bound in our physical environments and our physical environments are chosen based on our mental landscape and what we think is possible for us. So we'll talk through that. How do you create more opportunities for yourself? Because yeah, that's what you're here for, right? How many of you are here to get a degree to get you a job? Be honest. According to the research, 95% of you should have your hands in the air. Right? <laughs> we totally get that. Everybody here gets that. Right? Same on my campus. But what you want to start looking out for are the ways to allow your life to start unfolding in unexpected ways. Right? This is commonly known as the butterfly effect. One accidental handshake right, with someone. Someone you happen to meet suddenly becomes the person who gets you connected with that internship which takes you to that job and you didn't know any of that was going to happen. But the fact that the first step happened, it unfolds. So we're going to talk about how to make the most of that in college as well. Do consider something. Even though you are here, 95% of you at least, to get a degree and to go on to a fulfilling career that will let you take care of your families and all that kind of thing, I want you to see college for what it is. You will never be in another environment like this in your entire life. It will not happen. What is a college or university? It is an institution where experts in every possible discipline come together, further their work, further our understanding of the world, and when you go up and tap anyone on the shoulder and say, hey, what do you do? What are you studying? What are you interested in? They will tell you. They want to fill you with new knowledge and new horizons. Find that at the mall. Find that at the local Walmart, right? There are no places like colleges and universities. Anyway, these are important institutions and you are committing to spend the next four years or so in a place like this. If you are surrounded by experts all the time and you let them walk by and you do not take advantage of what they know, you've made a bad choice. Because once you leave here, and all of my friends who, when we stick around higher education, it's because we love, right? Like, that's what we're here for. We love you guys too, but we really love that environment. I'm gonna be honest, right? That's kind of how it works. But for most of us, when you move on in life, you never get that again. It's just a stage of your life, and you will look back, and actually, from a brain perspective, you will look back after the age of 25, because after the age of 25, your brain is fully mature, including a portion called the prefrontal cortex, which is where you really kind of get a sense of identity and recognition. All my peeps who are over the age of 25, you know, look back at yourself at 19, you're like, what the heck was I thinking? I thought I knew everything, <laughs> right? I did not know everything. I learned a lot, right? Take advantage of the opportunities here. They want you to. I've met your faculty. They want you to, okay? Okay. Let's start with that thought piece. Turn to a friend, define the word thought. Do it now. Problem solving. So, 
thought is a really, really broad thing. Any activity that your brain engages in to solve a problem, we count as thought. How many of you are hungry right now? You have a problem. <laughs> there is a part of your brain that is dedicated to trying to solve that problem right now. Possibilities are slight at the moment. I don't know whether they'll fix it for you later. But that's thought, brain activity, that is devoted to solving problems. Okay, that is an incredibly broad definition. There are particular kinds of thoughts that are conscious at times, but a lot of the time are kind of bubbling under the surface and coming through in our behavior and affect us that we're not necessarily aware of how that happens. And I'm talking here about something called mindset. Okay, so that's what I'm gonna go into next. Mm -hmm. Oop, I did it twice. Go back, go back. There we go. You'll see the babies again in a second. It's all right, okay. As far as I understand, human behavior, human development, human change over time, human growth, kind of different from that of a lot, a lot of other organisms, right? For the most part, for example, as I understand it, when most plants are growing, right, when they are growing, they're basically getting bigger and broader and eventually leading to seeding and stuff and bigger, broader, up one direction out, right? Like, <laughs> they kind of, there's not really a stopping necessarily, there may be some pausing depending on seasonality, but basically it's up and out, right? That, that's how plants grow, and when they stop growing, generally they die, right? Like it's either growing or it's dying, one or the other. That's not how humans work, right? Humans grow, develop, change in really interesting ways over time. Your brains are constantly kind of knitting new pathways to solve different kinds of problems than you had before. This is an intro, there are interesting stages of change, starting with a babies. there we go. Aren't they so cute? I don't know. Okay. Um, earlier in life, it tends to be like this explosion, right? Bigger, broader, get more functionality, more connections, right? This kind of thing. We start out that way. We have a period where we develop that way. We get to be kids. Now things get different because as we become aware of our world, of our activities, and what other people are doing, we start to compare ourselves to other people. And we start to develop a sense of me, and me is bound up in how I compare to you. And so if you ran faster than I did, then you're the one who can run, and I'm the one who can't. We have these very simple ways of processing these events that happen to us, and we start to tie, we can't help it, we tie emotions to these things. So when we're the one who loses the race and we're kids, it gets sad, right? It gets upsetting. If we get a grade that's not what our parents wanted on something, we feel not only like we can see that we are less, but there are emotions that tie to that too that can become things like shame, right? Or just a sense of hesitation. And I don't want to race again if I'm not going to win. Oh, not it. High school, college, this continues, right? Until we get to a point where we have a sense of we know ourselves. And we have, I don't know, kind of labels, categories for ourselves. I'm going to ask you a question. How many of you would agree with the statement, I am not a math person? Okay. There's no such thing as a math person or not a math person in reality. What you mean by that shortcut is, I don't see myself as good at math. I am less good at math than other people around me. I do not have a sense of confidence in myself when it comes to math. Math person, though, that's kind of rough, right? But it's not an unusual thing to think when we see that our abilities are less than somebody else's. And this can start to really shape, and you are carrying that, all of that with you now that you start college. You all have hopes, you have dreams, you have things that you want to do, but you also have this set of like, I am's and I am not's. And that is just a sum total of your, of your upbringing up to this point and your experiences. This is all coming back to mindset. It's a perspective, okay? It's a perspective. There's not such a thing as a math person or a not math person. There is a way of looking at our present level of ability, or the present things we're able to do in relation to math or writing or public speaking or whatever it is that they're gonna be asking you to do here, right? There is a way of looking at it 
and perspectives can be changed. And in fact, we do find that some people have one kind of perspective on themselves, and other people tend to have a different sort of perspective on their abilities, and that's called growth versus fixed mindset. Now, the fact of the matter is, our brains change constantly, whether we want them to or not. They're just constantly changing and reacting to stimuli, and we're constantly in a set of flux. Nothing about us is set in stone. Really, very few things about us are set in stone. They can be changed. And we can make choices that result in us having particular kinds of changes. But most of us, we don't know how our brain works. And so we just think of ourselves as either being good at math or not being good at math. And we assume that's like set in there, right? Like some people have a brain that just works for math. And some people don't. This is not factual, but that's just a way of looking at things. Let's talk through then some kind of technical details about these differences between mindsets, particularly fixed and growth mindsets. And for my faculty, friends, you heard this earlier, right? Okay. When it comes to something like a fixed or growth mindset, what are we talking about here? A growth mindset is the idea that we can take any given ability of our own and we can grow it, we can enhance it through two things, hard work and good guidance. Both pieces are important. It's not just that you bang your head against the wall trying to get better at something and automatically you do, but good guidance, feedback, taking that into account. If you grow, that's growth mindset, right? The opposite is fixed mindset. If we don't think we can change ourselves in any way, no matter what we do, if you don't think you can ever be a math person, that is more of what's called a fixed mindset. You only get so much ability in this area. Only get so much, and it's all you're gonna ever be able to have. It's what you're gonna have to work with for your entire life. It's just two ways of looking at whatever your ability is. I like to use the example of athleticism to help illustrate this, right? I will not ask you to share your number, but I could have you come up with a number in your mind from one to 10, one being utterly, completely unathletic, whatever that means to you, 10 being Olympian, ready to compete, right? And you could rate yourself anywhere on that scale. The number doesn't matter. I don't care what number you come up with, it doesn't matter in regards to mindset. What matters is, if I ask you then the question, wherever you are now, do you think you could move yourself in the positive direction with hard work and good guidance? Mm -hmm. So let's say I assess myself as a four, and someone asked me, could you change that if you wanted to? Hard work, good guidance. I said, well, I've only ever been a four. No one in my family is athletic. They're all like fours-ish, if they're lucky. Nope, I think this is just how I showed up in the world. This is how I am. This is just, this is just what I gotta work with. I'm a four, fated to die a four. Okay, that's a fixed mindset, right? I just have this belief about that aspect of myself. I think I can't change it. That's one way to look at it. The piece of you that will be continuously challenged, your ability that will be continuously challenged, or you will feel that's being continuously challenged by college education, is your intelligence. When you're in classes with people like me, people like them, they're gonna give you tasks that'll get progressively more challenging. In essence, they're kind of asking you over and over, are you smart enough? Can you do this? Are you able, right? That's not like what they're meaning to ask, but by giving you hard tasks, upping the ante, it's gonna make you feel like, eh, I gotta rise to a challenge somehow, right? Can I or can't I? When we have a fixed mindset about how intelligent we are, when we think, you've heard of IQ, right? When we think that IQ means you only get so much for your entire life, there's nothing you can do about it, you only have one set of smartness, that's it. If that's what you think intelligence is, then when you are faced with tough things, you're gonna to tend to have certain reactions to that, right? We all, when we are faced with a challenge that hits on our fixed mindset, we tend to back away. We tend to say, I, I don't wanna do that, right? If you just raised your hand and said, I'm not a math person, you are probably not eagerly awaiting your first homework. <laughs> so, eh, that's gonna be hard, I don't really wanna do that, I don't really like that. I don't know about how many of you, but a lot of our students will just not take a math class their first semester because they don't want to feel uncomfortable because they feel like they don't know the things. And maybe they don't actually know them, but they don't think they can ever know them. 
which is different. Hitting a failure tends to cause a person with a fixed mindset to give up. So it is possible that you will feel tempted to bail on your math class if you fail the first quiz. If you have a fixed mindset about that ability, I know I'm harping on math because it's common, whatever. Doesn't matter what the ability is, but a perceived failure, the person will tend to take as a signal, shouldn't be doing this, you shouldn't be doing this, right? You fail, you're not able, get out of here, right? This is a very common way to react when we have a fixed mindset. Effort, it is an incredible drag to spend our hard work and time on things that we think we're not gonna get anything out of. And if you're asked to do an assignment that you have to do certain things to accomplish and you feel like you can't do it, you're just gonna hate doing it, right? If I think I'm a four athletically and I can't do push-ups on my toes, if someone tells me, hey, Dr. D, get down on your hands and knees or whatever and do 10 push-ups, I'm like, why? I told you I can't do it. It doesn't make any sense for me to do it. I don't want to. It becomes very aversive. When that's the activity that's supposed to, like, if you want to get good at push-ups, you have to do them. Like, that's, that's what it takes to get athletic, is to do things like that, to push oneself outside of their comfort zone. And I might know that, but I still don't want to do it because I don't really think I can benefit. Goodness. The growth mindset goes the other way. If I think that I can grow my actual abilities, through hard work and good guidance, I'll tend to try to do as many hard things as possible so that I can learn because I know I can benefit, that my actual intelligence gets bigger and greater when I learn more things. And that's a good way to look at it, right? This is a growth mindset approach. People with a growth mindset about their intelligence will tend to embrace challenges, embrace, tolerate, at least follow through and finish. Okay. Even if you don't love doing your math, if you think maybe there's something good for you at the end, which there is, maybe if there's something good for you at the end, you at least push until you're done, right? And you do your best, and you learn from the feedback, and you stay active in it, right? That's evidence of a growth mindset. Persist in the face of setbacks. My favorite story about this, so I had a student about seven and eight years ago who, she was an um, education major, secondary education. Who are my education majors in the room? All right. Very good. She wanted to be a social studies teacher. That was her dream. I was teaching introductory psychology at the time. She was my student. She did fine. She went on. A few years later, I got a Facebook friend request from her. She wasn't my student anymore, so I said, sure. And then she's getting close to graduation, which was a year ago, 2018. She's coming into the last semester. She posts one day on Facebook, get ready to take my licensing test. Licensing test for social studies is really hard because there's so many things you need to know. Lots of history is really what I think she got caught up on. But so she says, I'm gonna go take the licensing test. Today's the big day. When I get done with this test, I'm gonna be a teacher. Everybody pray for me. I know that you're there for me. I'm gonna do this, right? That's the post in the morning. The post in the afternoon, she failed, right? She did not pass the test. And she goes, well, I failed it, but I'm gonna try again, because I definitely wanna be a teacher. I'm gonna try again. Watch out for me, I'll, I'll do this. A Couple weeks later, morning post. Okay, today's my retesting day. I'm ready to go, I'm prepared. Everybody pray for me, okay. A little later in the day, I failed again. I was like, shoot, <laughs> I wanted to see her pass. Still in the, don't worry, I'm gonna keep going, I'm gonna take it again. We went through this cycle nine times. Nine times, okay? Nine times. Nine times in the morning. Today's the day, I got it. End of the day, I fail again. Oh, ouch. You know, you know how that is when someone you care about, you're going like this, right? I must admit, by about the seventh time, I started thinking, should she be a social studies teacher? I don't know if that's the, I'm starting to wonder if that's the future for her. But she was persistent, and so, Tenth time, she passed. Tenth time, she posted in the morning, same thing. Today is the day, I know I'm gonna get it. And then the end of the day, you guys, I passed. Oh my gosh. And I'm like, yes. Okay. That is growth mindset, right? She kept failing, but she kept learning and pushing herself 
forward until she accomplished something that she knew was within her power. She looked at the feedback every time to figure out what she had done wrong. She knew if she strengthened up, she could get there. She'd see her score creeping, creeping, so it's realistic. She's moving forward, boom, she gets it, okay? Would you fail nine times to pass the 10? Would you fail nine times to pass the test? Because some of you are going to have to take certain tests to get to certain goals. You're gonna to have to accomplish certain things to make your dream happen, right? Some of us have to adjust our dream a little bit, right? And that's not failure necessarily. It's being thoughtful and reading reality and seeing what are my strengths, how do I move forward? But there's no giving up in that, right? There's no giving up in that. See effort as a path to mastery. My student worked her tail off, and that's how she got through this, right? She worked her tail off, she got the guidance she needed, and she moved on. And she's just finished her first year as an official teacher. She's doing great, right? That's what everybody here wants for you, is to see you do the same kind of thing. In contrast, let's go back to the fixed mindset. Fixed mindset folks, when they are given feedback that's meant to help, that is, when they're being taught, they may feel it as criticism, right? As just this message of, you're not good enough. You did this wrong, you did this wrong, you did this wrong. And that hurts, because when we already know that we didn't do great, then it's not the most pleasant thing, but it's hard to learn if we just see it as personal criticism instead of like guidance, which it is. Growth mindset, hard work, guidance, that's that piece. Success of others. When we're around people who are very successful in the thing that we want to be successful in, if we have a fixed mindset, we tend to feel things that are not so hot, like jealousy, like envy, like uncertainty or an inadequacy, right? Because we're not sure we can ever have what they have, right? I've had students in the past, when I've tried to bring them aside to say, can I help you figure out this particular kind of report? They're like, what do you know? It's easy for you. What do you know about what's easy for me, right? Versus what I've had to work really hard to achieve. I've had things that I've had to overcome, right? But when you have a fixed mindset, it's easy to look at a successful person and be like, well, they just have it, and I just don't. And that's not fair. A fixed mindset leads to sometimes not great places, right? Because when we do not push ourselves to keep persisting and growing ourselves and actually developing that set of abilities that we want, we then can feel out of control in our lives and like things are not going the way we want them to. And actual mental health conditions like depression, anxiety, et cetera, can be exacerbated by that feeling of not being in control. And that's not great, right? I feel like I hit the wrong button. The growth mindset person tends to learn from the criticism, hear them out at least, what can I get from this? And tends to find heroes, find lessons and inspiration in other people's success. So to say, if you did it, I can do it, right? So if you find someone here, one of your faculty, who's doing the kind of thing that you want to do or knows how to get there, start tagging around, right? And asking them, how did you do it? How did you do it? Guide me. And they will see you as that growth mindset person who's like, wow, they're really trying. They understand that if they grow themselves, they can do just the kinds of things. I mean, none of us see ourselves as superhuman, right? It's not magic or something that we ended up doing what we're doing. We worked for it, and you can too, right? That's kind of the bottom line. Having a growth mindset yields a lot of benefits. It really does. And if you want to know what parts of yourself may be more in the fixed mindset side, then just think about what is it when you observe it in somebody else you tend to feel jealous of? As if you can't have it. As if you can't have physical health. As if you can't have the ability to speak in front of others. As if you can't have a rewarding relationship. I don't know. Maybe it's just that you have convinced yourself you can't have it and that there's, you can't do anything to get there. Yes, you can. There are things you can do. At least start the process of thinking, thought, right? That, that's the deal. Okay, we're gonna test you guys a little bit here. So I have a bit of a secret identity. Um, I have been a boxing instructor in the past. Um, I don't have time to do that in my present life, but I am trained. 
and most folks I know do not know how to, to throw a proper jab, right? So what I'd like to do is to teach you guys how to throw a proper jab, which means you'll need to get out of your chair, get stand up where you are. Oh my God. <laughs> Okay, 
but you will never get good at throwing a punch if you don't throw them. Right? It's just how it works. You get it? You with me? Yeah. yeah. No. Okay, let's move this on. You did good. You did good. I love this. This was uh, at our latest graduation in May on our campus. The student wrote this on her mortarboard. I love the person I've become because I thought to become her. Oh, hey, yeah, you did. Yes, you did. <laughs> That's great, right? The student gets this sense of, I made me. And you need to leave here feeling that you made you, that nobody here made you do what you end up doing. No one else's accomplishment affected you. You can claim every piece that you earned it, right? That's what everybody here wants to feel. Okay. And you'll feel that in other parts of your life, too. You're very powerful, provided you know how powerful you are. When you think about most of our inspirational quotes, pick your favorite religious text, pick your favorite leader. When it comes down to accomplishment, they all talk about hard work. They all talk about overcoming, right? Because it's true. All right. All right. You all have habits. We're moving on to the actions part. You all have habits. You have baked in ways that you do things, right? You have ways that you have learned to study, you have ways that you've learned to arrange your time. A lot of you just kind of like, whatever's the next thing, I'll just do that, <laughs> right? Whatever your old way is, it's time to think about it, okay? It's time to understand what your old way was and develop some new habits. Developing habits is not easy, right? It takes, what they say, 21 times doing something. It takes about 21 times doing something the same way before it becomes habitual. Right? You've got planners, Do you, will you use it? Right? It'd be a good habit to develop. Right? Your habits are more important than your goals. I don't care what you tell me you're gonna do. I do not care. I care what you are doing now. I care the action you are taking right now. That's what matters to me, right? That's what matters. That's, that's what's gonna make your future. So let's get ready. How about some habits? These buttons have never helped me here. There we go. That one's easy. Go to class, for goodness sake. Make it a habit to go to class. The easiest way to fail, the best way to fail, the clearest path to an F, don't go. That's just basic research. It's logical. It makes sense. I don't know. I don't care. If your faculty tell you on the first day of class, I don't take attendance. I don't care if you're here. Don't believe them. Right? <laughs> Who cares what they think about that? Show up anyway. Just make it a habit to go to class. Do not miss. Okay? If you stop going, you might as well accept that is a major danger sign for your possibilities of graduating. And you are paying good money to be here, and your parents and your families are counting on you, and if you choose not to go to class, that's on you, friend. That's the thing about knowledge is once you have it, you're responsible for it, go to class. Read the syllabus. I want to get one of those t-shirts. It's on the syllabus. <laughs> Stop asking me. It's on the syllabus. We tell you a lot about what we expect and when the due dates are and when, how to do things, what not to do. Sometimes we put in hidden quizzes and all these kind of things to see, did you read it? It's shocking how often you're like, we told you that. <laughs> in college, once you have been given a document that describes the entire course, we have told you. You have been informed, right? So free syllabus. Make it a habit every semester. Do the work. Make it a habit to do the work. If work is put in front of you, do it. <laughs> right? I know you're thinking, she's this is so condescending. Really? When we see every semester students who stop doing these things? Right? I'm just telling you now, so that you know ahead of time. Like just we're watching to do it. Learn from your mistakes. When we grade things and put writing on them, please read it, because we are putting faith in you that you can benefit from what we say. We see you as learners. We see you as learners. So we're trying to teach you. So when you make a mistake, accept it. I made a mistake. I'm going to learn from it. Do the next thing. That is an action, right? People who do not learn from their mistakes do not accomplish much in life. 
So again, I don't care what your goals are. I care what you do. Don't take shortcuts. Don't cheat. It's not worth it, okay? Just don't. <laughs> don't find ways around the learning because your faculty have designed your courses, your programs, because they've gotten together and said, you know what someone who wants to be a nurse really needs to be able to do? These things. You know what someone who wants to teach English needs to be able to do? These things. And when you shortcut, you're making yourself labor less able to do the things that they have said are crucial to your success. So present convenience, but you're sacrificing development and the ability to make yourself competitive. So don't do that. Find your tribe. Build relationships, okay? What is a relationship? You only think of it at this age probably in terms of someone I like to hang out with and makes me feel fun and okay or whatever. No, your relationships are your professional networks in seed form, okay? You do not know where your fellow club member will end up working one day, what city, what role. But if you stay in touch with one another and they turn out to be the VP of something, and they have an open position, you want to know that person. So you're like, how did they happen to get that position? It's over half of jobs that are now, like they're not even publicly advertised. They are, they are snagged through networks, right? This university has thousands of alumni running all over the region and all over the country. Join them, right? Become part of them. Join that network, find a tribe, and have fun along the way, right? When you feel a part of something, you're more likely to stick with it. They give you energy. Do not quit. You're taking on too much. We have students on our campus who will quit after 30 credit hours, 60 credit hours, 90 credit hours, 100 credit hours, 120 gets the degree, they quit after 100. You know what they're left with? Three and a half years of debt, wasted time, and no more ability to get a job than a high school graduate. You guys here. Why go through all that? Right? So I always make it orientations. I make my students make a promise to their families, and the families are like, yes, please. I promise if I start, I will finish. They, I make them say it. I promise if I start, I will finish because the stakes are too high. Do not quit. And for some of you, it may be a little bit of a winding path. That's okay. Learn from your mistakes. Come back and be done. That's what you're here for. You're taking this on. You all, your credit reports are showing your financial debt, not your parents. This is on you. Acknowledge that. Embrace that. Do not quit. Get something out of this. Aristotle had our number long, long time ago. We are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, then, is not an act, but a habit. This is like my favorite quote ever. Excellence is not an act, a single thing. Excellence is a habit. Right? Whenever I'm afraid to do something, I was afraid to come here. I was afraid to speak to you. I was afraid to have this whole visit. Right? When I was invited, it was the first time I'd done anything quite like this. But I said to myself, excellence is a habit. Excellence is a habit. Go do something new, grow, mess up, do some things well, get more, become more. Opportunity, so opportunity is bound by your physical environment. Opportunity is bound by your mental landscape, right? You are doing something new. You are in new surroundings. You're surrounded by new people. See that as opportunities and make the most of it whenever you can. I've come to know this institution fairly well over the last couple of days and they are chock full of opportunity. But if you just drive home after class or if you just go back to your dorm and settle in and you don't take part, you are just cutting off all kinds of options. You're cutting off whole futures, okay? You're cutting off whole futures. I know that many of you are coming here with one goal in mind. I came to my college education with one goal in mind. I was gonna be an astronaut, come hell or high water, that was it. Until I actually started to do astronauty things and I was like, nope, that's, that's not the right thing for me. And suddenly I have to retool, right? 
right? See your future as full of pathways, okay? Full of possibilities. And then if you put yourself in more places and hear about more stuff, your perspective grows to where you go, okay, if this path doesn't quite work, I got this one as a backup. And this is plan C, and this is plan D, and this is plan E, and I just need to figure out which of these I want to start exploring, right? That's a choice to take advantage of those opportunities or not. Yeah, I can feel a little bit uncomfortable, right? Newness. Just chalk it up to stupid biology. Sorry, Dr. Pilgrim. Chalk it up to stupid biology that new things are uncomfortable. That's just, I know. We're built that way. We are built that way. The unfamiliar tends to make us uncomfortable. Okay, accept that. It's a reality. Do stuff anyway. Oh my gosh, what do I do now? Okay. I loved that, this is Zach, Zachary, told you to fall in love with something? Yes. Because the opposite of fear and anxiety is a sense of passion and love, right? So if you find something here to fall in love with, whether it's an organization or a particular teacher's teaching style, or like me, I fell in love with my psychology class, right? Find something to fall in love with and it will get you through to the next thing. So the next opportunity comes forward and you keep moving forward. I'm going to have you guys play a game here. Um, how many of you have ever done uh, improvisation games? Like you were in theater? Yeah. Very good. Okay. For the grand majority of people who have not done this, improv, they're like exercises to get you thinking about things and feel comfortable around others. Uh, this is, these are images from um, a group called Improv Anywhere, and they like to set up kind of public situations where people can either play with them or not. And so this was in Chicago. And so they had a bunch of their members who were going down and down escalator. If you've ever been down into a subway and it's like four stories of escalator, so it's forever. And while they're going down, they're holding these signs. And they say, Rob wants to give you a high five, right? And as they're going down, the people going up are seeing these signs. Get ready, comes down the sign, right? And then this is Rob, right? So they just, Rob, and he's got his hand out, right? Waiting for high fives. And it's really funny to watch because most people going by are just like, oh my god, I'm not, there's no, this is stupid, I'm, there's no way I'm gonna, who, this is creepy, right? <laughs> like whatever. But every once in a while, you get someone who's like, yeah, I'll play, right? Okay, that kind of improv game we're going to play. A little bit different than that, but we're going to play. It's called Yes And. All right, very simple. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, you heard of this. Yes And. Basically, it's a spoken game with a partner, so find a partner, just someone sitting next to you, someone you can play with. Okay, and the way it goes is in improv, when someone invites you into a scene, no matter how ridiculous it is, the thing that they're asking you to do, you go along with it. You play along. That's the rule of improv. That's where humor comes from, because you just follow the person down the ridiculous path. Yes and is a way to exercise that. So I'm going to have you practice going back and forth with a yes and. I'm going to ask you a question. One of you, the partner, first partner is going to kick it off and say, OK, it would be like this. And the other one of you is going to say, yes, and it would have this. And then you go back and forth, yes, and we'll go like this, OK? So I want you to think about the best vacation ever. Best vacation ever, OK? And then one partner just starred. The best vacation ever would have blank. And then the other one go, yes, and, and then add to it and go back and forth, OK? So do that for a minute or two. <laughs> What would the best college education you can imagine be like? 
All right, that's your real task. So go back. Yes, Andy. Okay. Best college education ever. Go.
If you are willing, I'd like you to pull out your phone and to send me a text message. To me. Send me a text message. You can just tell me your first name. You don't have to tell me who you are. Tell me your first name and describe just one honest word about how you feel about starting college. And I promise I will text you back. It won't be today. It probably won't be tomorrow. But I promise I will text you back. Okay? Yeah. I'm Dr. D, if you want to remember who I am. So when I text you back, you're like, hi, it's Dr. D. And you're like, oh, yeah. Okay. Name, one honest word about starting college. Go ahead and do it now. Ooh, I see them coming. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. I won't creep on you. I'll just respond one time and leave you alone. But I do like to hear from you. Looking at the time. So I want to give the student leaders who were up here talking to you before, I asked them whether they would be willing to share some honest ideas about what I had to say. They didn't know what I was going to say. I think there's a microphone right here. Right? Um, and you'll want to come up on stage so that we don't get this feedback done. Okay? And I'd like them to say a little bit about what they remember about being in your guys' seat and how they got themselves over the hump to do something to create opportunities. Is that able to come off of there? You're just going to bring the whole thing? Bring the whole thing. You can use this one. today and uh, so we're going to give you a link 101 water bottle with some uh, pins in it and hope when you drink out of this you'll uh, remember how we're going. Now Dr. D's chariot, your, your chariot awaits in the circle. Okay. Okay. So uh, 
Let's wish her well. She's got to catch a plane, so she's got to take off. Um, again, as I mentioned, I'm Dr. Pilgrim. I teach in the biology uh, link section, and uh, this is my last act as a director for the last two years. So, really appreciate it. I'm going to introduce our new link director, uh, Brittany Aga, and she's going to come up to the stage and she's going to take it over right now. tired. Um, so how many athletes are in the house? Raise your hand real quick. Woo! Give it up for the athletes. That's right. All right. So you know how to do this. I'm trusting the rest of you know how to do it as well. When I say one, two, three, I want you to yell Bearcats as loud as you can. One, two, three. Bearcats! No, no, no. I said, when I say one, two, three, I want you to yell Bearcats as loud as you can. One, two, three. Bearcats! There you go. Now, we're going to see how well you listen and how quickly you do what I ask you to do. Stand up. Sit down. Some of you forgot how to sit down. There we go. Stand up, but be quiet. Excellent. Some of you forgot part of that. Sit down and be quiet. Thank you. I want to talk about some of the things that Dr. D was mentioning very briefly because I find college to be the most amazing time in your life. And I say that as someone who has been in college a long time, I have four degrees, we have two adult children that have been through college. They have four degrees between them. There will never be another time in your life will, where you will have so much opportunity and so much freedom. You literally have the potential to choose to be the undefeated soccer team, if that's what you want to be, to be the best nurse, if that's what you choose to be, to be the greatest teacher, if that's what you choose to be, to be a student government leader, if that's what you choose to be. But you have to choose those things. Because unlike high school, we're not gonna be knocking on your door at the morning in the morning saying, it's time to get up and get ready for your eight o'clock class. Or have you eaten healthy options today? Nobody's going to be asking you those questions because those are things you have to choose for yourself. So I'm going to talk very briefly about mental health and choices that you have ahead of you. All right, so we're going to talk about counseling services specifically. And one logical question is what are the things that we have available to you from a counseling service perspective? First question you might logically ask is who do we see? We predominantly see, once I figure this out, we predominantly see students just like you, first year students. So out of all students we saw last year, 158 of them were students exactly like you. And you can see we saw a few less sophomores, a few less juniors, and a few less seniors. The logical question is why? 
And the logical answer is think back to yesterday when you arrived on campus, if you just moved in yesterday, I know some of you have been here longer than that, what you were feeling yesterday. So you probably felt some combination of excitement, anxiety, trepidation, fear. Maybe you're about to move in with a roommate you've never met before. All of those things are normal. And think about what you felt the moment your parents drove away. So some of you felt excited, right? Finally, mom and dad are gone. Now I can get on with my college life. Some of you were a little bit sad. Some of you were afraid. And all of those things are okay. That's what we're here to help you with. So then what do we see students for? What are the things that um, students come in to uh, ask for assistance in the counseling office? Here's some of those things. Anxiety, depression, substance abuse, stress management, relationships, academic performance. You can read the list. All of you will experience some of those things at some point in your career here at Lander. When you need some help, we're here to help you with those things. This is where we're located, in the Genesis building, which is adjacent to LUPD. You're gonna hear from Chief Allen in just a moment. You see the hours, you see the phone number. I don't expect you to remember all of that, but we will have that information available for you. Different ways you can get in touch with us. You can call the office, you can stop by, you don't have to have an appointment. You can email, you can speak to a nurse because they're conveniently located, uh, immediately adjacent to our nurses. And we will work around your class schedule. So you let us know when it's convenient for you and we're happy to work with you. Remember, college is about choices. We're here to help you navigate those choices. One, two, three. Fair yeah. Do it again. One, two, three. Fantastic. Thank you, Chief Allen. Uh, we do have 13 full-time police officers here on campus. 
Um, they're all certified. We're state constables, which means we have statewide jurisdiction. Uh, we're here 24 hours a day, seven days a week, including Christmas, all holidays. Police officers and dispatcher will be on this campus. Uh, we enforce all federal, state, and local laws. Um, but what I want to talk to you about is that you guys are here for the first time. You're away from home. You're away from your parents. You're away from someone that's actually going to be telling you what to do. So basically, you're an adult right now. No one's going to be waking you up, telling you to go to class. No one's going to be making a lot of your decisions for you. You're making your own decisions, um, which also means when you're out away from Lander, you're going to be meeting people and seeing people that are going to be trying to take advantage of you. So uh, I want you guys to make sure if you have any kind of issues, you reach out to someone you can trust on this campus. You can come to LUPD, speak to me. Um, we have a, a lot of great people in our, in our office that you can talk with. You're going to have professors and staff members that you can talk with, but we don't want people taking advantage of you. Um, you're going to have to get to know Greenwood, so just don't be out roaming streets if you have a car. Um, ask someone around here about the location. We don't want you going out in some of these bad neighborhoods. Um, who hasn't been to LUPD yet? Anybody hasn't been over to LUPD? What? All right, you need to find out where we're located. We're in Jensen's Hall. Um, some of you are going to be parking, parking permits. Questions? Some of you are going to be getting parking permits. You're going to pay for that parking permit over in the business office, and you'll pick it up at over at our office in Jensen's Hall. Someone coming to teach this class for me? Um, we have surveillance cameras throughout the campus. Uh, we have dispatchers that will be viewing those cameras in our office. They just don't sit there and watch the cameras 24-7. Uh, They're doing other duties as well, dispatching calls, uh, monitoring cameras, uh, answering, answering the phone, several different things. But someone's always in our office whenever it's needed. This is Genesis Hall. Um, those are patrol cars for patrol on foot and the patrol vehicles, as well as golf carts. We have 30 full-time, 30 employees here at the university. We have 13 full-time police officers. Again, like I said, um, most of us are nice until they give them a reason not to be nice. Um, but again, we do enforce the rules and regulations. Um, we would love for you guys to come meet us, talk to us. Um, we do a lot of safety presentations, educational presentations, and we want you guys to succeed. We know there's a lot of times that you're going to get in some situations that you shouldn't be in, and we try to help you and prevent that before it happens. There are times that you will get in trouble. Um, no alcohol and drugs are allowed on this campus. You're underage, you shouldn't be drinking anyway. Um, if we come to your room, or we see you drinking or using drugs, uh, you can go to jail, you will be charged. Um, there was some, something will go on your record. We have a record, a criminal record. So we don't want you to get in any kind of trouble where you're gonna be charged or fined or go to jail. As far as our employees go, again, we have the dispatchers. We have a parking enforcement officer. Um, his job is to write parking tickets. He patrols the campus five days a week, and his job is to ticket people who are not following the rules. When you get your parking permit, you need to make sure you look at the rules and regulations for your parking areas. Again, I'm here are some numbers. These are important numbers. You've probably seen them several times today and over the last month. Um, I know you're not gonna remember them. If you wanna take your phone out for a brief second and, and take a picture of it, you can. I'll give you a second to do that. Um, the Wellness Center is located right beside the police department. We work very closely together. Sometimes if it's late at night um, and the counselor's not available, well, what we can do is an officer can speak with you. If you need to speak with a counselor, he will call that counselor and you can talk with the counselor at that time. If the counselor needs to come in, the counselor will come in to see you. 
We have what we call the Lander Alert System. Um, this is an option that you guys have. Your parents will love that you have it. We would love that you have it if you sign up for it. All you have to do is go up on the website. You make sure you uh, register two cell phones, two numbers. Um, you'll get text messages and emails on any kind of uh, severe weather or potential dangers on or around campus. Um, we also have a public uh, PA system at the top of the campus here. We broadcast this the first of every first month of every month, and this is to make sure it's operating properly. It's just a test. It's just a test to make sure it's operating properly. If there's a real emergency, um, we will let you know what that emergency is. You will get text messages and emails advising you of what the issue may be, and you'll have. Uh, directions on what you should do in that situation. If you go up on our website, there's a lot of information on there for you guys. We ask that you go up on the website and you get a chance, click on University Police, and there are a lot of, a lot of different programs and activities you guys can find on our website. A lot of different situations you may be put in, but every building will let you know what you need to do as far as evacuation goes and your meeting points. Captain Gossip. Can you stand up there for us? Just up there a little bit. Um, yeah, this right. Yeah. Up top. Um, we have emergency phones throughout the campus. If you guys are ever in a situation where you can't get your cell phone or you, you feel something's not right, all you have to do is find one of the emergency phones. We have 45 located across campus. Um, we check them about every three, two or three weeks to make sure they're operating properly. But all you have to do is there's a little red button, you push that button, it automatically comes to LUPG. Um, and also will be dispatched to you. Um, what I ask you to do if you're around that, pole, that button, and you can stay there, we ask that you stay there. If for some reason you can't stay there, we ask that if, if, you, if you're leaving, make loud noises. Some of you may want to carry a whistle or something around with you. Um, go to like a well-lit area. Um, what I'm asking you not to do, try not to go down a dark alley and try not to trip and fall. So we want to make sure you're safe. But again, if, if you, uh, whenever you need us, you push that button, we'll be coming. It is not a toy. Um, we have cameras in a lot of areas, so if we see you playing with, with the, the button, we will be coming looking for it. Uh, a couple things. You guys are getting to know each other and meet each other, most, mostly for the first time. Things I'm going to ask you to do, make sure you lock all your belongings. If you have a car, make sure your car doors are locked. Um, when you're in your residence hall, make sure you lock your doors. If you have a suite mate, roommates, not locking doors. You need, you need to sit down with them and tell them to make sure they lock those doors. Okay. Don't leave your credit card, debit card, personal information out anywhere for someone to see. Because again, you know they're whoever may be your friends, you really don't know each other that well yet. Um, we know from experience, we've seen a lot of, a lot of friends and roommates uh, stealing from each other. So we want to make sure that you can look at that person to the left or the right of you and really see how well you know it. Um, if you're in the dining hall, library, um, again, make sure you keep your belongings with you at all times. We do have crimes that, that are committed on this campus. People will go into your room, they will go into your car. They don't break your glass, glass out. They don't bust the door down, but they will check the handle. If it's unlocked, they will come in your room and take your stuff. Uh, same thing, when you're out, you're away from campus, and someone has if it's a, a Sprite, Coke, glass of water, if you walk away from it, it's not yours anymore. Don't go back and pick it up and start drinking. Uh, don't walk alone out the dark. If you're in the library or you have a job so you're working late at night uh, and you need someone to escort you when you get back to campus, you call us. If you're getting up at 12, call us around 8 and 9 say, hey, um, I'm getting up at midnight. I stay in Centennial Hall. Can you have someone, an uh, officer in the, in the area when I get off? We'll have an officer 
in that area. Um, sometimes they'll even get on the walk and talk with you if you need that to happen. But an officer will park in the parking lot, watch you, make sure you get into your, your building safely. Um, now, if you're out in your clubbing and you come in at three and you say, hey, I just, I'm about been out having a good time, can the officer say, hey, we're, we're not going to make a habit of that. But if you have a legit reason where you just need us to be there for you, we're going to be there for you. We're going to make sure you're safe. But again, don't walk alone after dark. Uh, make sure you have a friend. If uh, you're going from one residence hall to another residence hall, uh, and your friend, if they don't meet you halfway, if you know you have a friend, they haven't got there in a certain amount of time, go ahead and call LUPD. You better start going out and see if you can locate this person. Uh, make sure you don't prop open doors. Um, some, of, some of these buildings have uh, an alarm system on them, so if it's open for a certain amount of time, the alarm will go off. Some don't. But again, don't prop open doors. Um, we've had cases now where we've had like possums and snakes and things get in. Um, so we don't want y'all to have to deal with that. Um, that's not even talking about the bad guy that they try to get in. So make sure we keep these door, doors closed. If you see a door prop open, go ahead and close it. Uh, be suspicious. Uh, if you get that, that gut feeling or if you see something that, that doesn't seem right, it's probably not right. We don't mind you guys calling us. You can call us anytime. Uh, again, we have some nice officers. Some of them, you know, call them. They'll come and they'll, they'll chat with you. Learn, learn some information about you. They'll share some things about themselves as well. Uh, if you have something that's not an emergency, if you hear about something that may be going on, some people call it snitching. We don't call it snitching. We, come up with, we call it keeping you safe. Um, if you know about somebody that has something going on or you heard of something and you don't you can't come to LUPD, you can um, go up on the website. We have an anonymous tip form that you can fill out. Um, you don't have to put any of your information in, you just fill it out, send it to us. All of our officers and our dispatcher will get it. We'll take a little look into the matter. We talked about parking. Basically, when you get your rules and regulations with that parking permit, make sure you look over. About every student that gets a ticket says, I didn't know I, I couldn't do that. You're going to have the rules and regulations. Make sure you look over those rules and regulations. If you have a situation where you are borrowing your mom's car, your dad's car, your friend's car for a week or a couple days, all you have to do is come by our office and ask for a temporary parking permit. We'll give that to you free of charge. Um, there is a limit on how many times you can get it, but uh, we want to look out for you. We know you have a uh, parking permit and you don't have your car, we will give you a temporary until you get your vehicle back. We also have guest parking, so if you have a friend or family member that's coming on campus and they need to come by and get a guest permit, you can come by. Again, that's free of charge. We also have handicap uh, permits. Our handicap permits are for Landers campus only. Uh, we ask that you have a doctor's note when you come by. Um, we do have a young lady, she didn't have a doctor's note, but she was on crutches and she had a cast on her foot. I knew she needed one, so she was able to get it. Those are just some of our violations. Um, I'm going to skip this because no one's going to get a ticket. And you will, we will have maps spread out, we have in our office. I think they're, they're gonna be emailed to you if they haven't already. And um, they'll be going periodic, out periodically. Smoke-free campus, you cannot smoke on campus. That includes vaping. Um, I know a lot of vapes now have their odor list and you can get different, different flavors. Uh, if an officer was to see you vaping on campus, they may take your vape and have it tested to make sure marijuana's not in. So make sure you're not vaping or smoking on campus. Um, we want to make sure our campus stays nice and clean. Um, I'm quite sure you and your parents when you came to visit, you saw it look, look pretty good. We have, we have some men and women that put a lot of time in trying to make sure it looks good for you guys, for us, and for anybody that comes on campus. Um, we want to make sure it stays looking nice. So make sure you don't, don't live. Uh, even though they've been paid to make sure it looks good, we don't want to add to us to their extra duties. There are fines for littering. 
Um, if you're caught littering, you could get charged up to a, over a thousand dollars. I don't want anybody to be calling mom and dad saying, "Hey, I need a thousand dollars because I threw a piece of paper on the ground." And no alcohol on campus. Not only can you not drink on campus, you can't be around alcohol. If I have a group of people in the parking lot of my room and I walk up and there's four people there and only one's been drinking but three in the room with them, that one person is going to be charged. The other three, their names and information is going to be placed in that report. At that time, the judicial affairs will contact you asking why you were in that room and you didn't leave or you didn't call somebody. So if you have someone you're around and they're, they're doing something that they shouldn't be doing, best thing to do is get away from them or call, call LUP and let us come take care of them. I want to make sure we don't have any questions on that because again, we get that a lot. People don't realize they can't be in the same area with the city of alcohol and drugs. Um, you guys, hopefully you all have your ID. Um, things we do for you guys, we will, if you lock yourself out of your, your room, we'll unlock it for you the first time, it's free. Anytime after that is $5, and it's charged to your account. Please do not give the police officer any money. If you have a dead battery where your car's been sitting for a long time, we will come and jump your car for you. Um, we do store weapons because there are no weapons allowed on campus. But if you have, uh, if you're a hunter and you have a, a weapon, we ask that you make sure your weapon is unloaded, bring it by our police department. We'll sign it in. Um, anytime you need it, we'll sign it back out to you. Um, something I'm going to mention to you guys, uh, we have a civilian response to an active shooter. Uh, we have two certified instructors here. We do a lot of active shooter training. So that is something you guys can be looking for. Um, we have a group. If, it's, uh, if you have a group of them on the same hall that y'all want to get together and um, do it like a, a civilian response to active shooter, things you should do. Um, we just ask that you call LUPD. We can set it up for you. Um, what we do is it's called Avoid, Do Not Defend. And again, we have two great instructors and we have some active shooting instructors as well. So hopefully when we get everything built up, you guys will be, will be reaching out to some of you and you can be a participant in some of our activities. Um, I just wanted to see if we had any questions, any concerns before I close it out. You are not allowed to have a taser. But if you have if you have a taser, pepper spray, pocket knife. Most guys carry pocket knives. Ladies like to have taser, uh, a small, small pepper spray on their keychain. If you do, that's fine. Um, as long as we don't know about it. But if someone calls and says, hey, this person has pepper spray and they're spraying everybody in the building, <laughs> then we have a problem. So again, we want to treat you guys like adults. So you are adults right now. Now if the bad guy comes and tries to attack you, you make sure they know that you have that taser. You give them everything that taser has. Any more questions? All right, I want to thank you all for coming.